It's been a great week. It's been a great week and democracy is alive and well, right? It's exciting. Um, and we're into, you know, <laughs> Stephanie's going to get up here in a minute. I was talking to her today. She hasn't had any internet this week, so, so we had to uh, work together. And, and uh, she said on the phone, she goes, you know, on this eve, 248 years ago, a bunch of guys met in a room and they, they weren't sure. And, and uh, here we are. We're in a room, about the same number of people, and we're not sure, right? That's good. It's all good. So um, I'm going to so, turn it over to just her. Just so gonna... you know, tonight is about moving beyond, I want to say a couple things, moving okay. beyond the inertia of mediocrity in democracy. And we will define what that looks like and how we can all play a part in moving beyond it. The last thing, I, I also want to... Um, just give a big shout out. I don't see Axel here, but to the school district for allowing us to use this space for five Monday nights during the summer. It's highly unusual for them to kind of allow that to happen. And so Axel, I've thanked him a number of times, but thank you, thank you, thank you to the school district. Yes, you bet. Yeah, yeah, at the end of this, some of you signed up, and for those of you who weren't here last week, uh, Axel's willing to do a, uh, a short tour of this incredible facility called the Innovation Center. So if you want to stick around after 7.30, he'll be able to do that tour. I also want to thank Phil, our videographer, who's been with us since day one. Thank you, Phil, for doing all the work. Appreciate it. His work is in front of him. Yes, and, and I want to thank, I want to thank uh, Carol, the person who puts together these slides and makes these nights happen in that way. Carol has done a great job with, um, and our conversations, thank you, thank you, Carol. Our conversations every, every week in order to put the content together can be, uh, every now and then can get a little bit vigorous. How about that? And so, but that's the nature of democracy. Vigorousness is an aspect of it in terms of how we discuss and how to move forward. So anyway, I think the entire community should have vigorous conversations, but we need to figure out how to unify on purpose. And so, hi, Michelle. We're going to call you up because you're late here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I was listening to Biden's response on the immunity, so I figured. Okay. All right. All right. That's the last of our. That's the last conversation we're going to have tonight about anything partisanship-wise. You know, as you know, maybe you don't. But one of the things that we did with this School of Statesmanship, Stewardship, and Service as we brought people together was the major ground rule for uh, our conversations was, would, was that it would be nonpartisan and it would be as non-ideological as possible. And so, and so it's almost to the person, everybody said that some of the richest conversations they have are when they come to these, our meetings as we put together the curriculum and the syllabi for the 45 courses because we stayed out of the weeds of partisanship and we stayed out of the weeds of ideological-like thinking as we focused on something in our minds were considerably higher in terms of what we were trying to deal, deal with. And so we created a purpose that we unified around and then, and then put the uh, meat together in terms of trying to figure out how to, how to bring that purpose to life. So with that, I am going to turn it over to the one and only Steffi Rossi, and she's going to take us through a slide. And we'll go from there. So one of the things I don't believe in are coincidences. So today is July 1st. And on July 2nd, the Declaration of Independence was put forth. And that was the day that the Founding Fathers thought would be recognized as the day in history where they declared their independence from England. July 2nd, and that's what John Adams thought would be re recognized and celebrated throughout history. You see his quote here, okay, about what he believed about this declaration. And I want you to think about how grand a declaration it was. Tomorrow's July 2nd. They were declaring their independence against one of the strongest countries of the time period one of the, the strongest navy. They had defeated the Spanish. They were bigger than anybody imagined. And the odds of them succeeding was minuscule. No one thought they had a chance. 
No one at all. And they did it. No one signed the original Declaration of Independence. Do you all know that? They didn't sign it, but why? Why would they not sign this document? What would it do if somebody found out their names were on that document? They would hang them. It was treason. So none of them signed the original document. It was signed later, the next couple of days, but no one would publicize who signed it because it was an act of treason. They were willing to risk everything they believed in for the freedom that they thought man deserved, people deserved at the time. That, that to be ruled by a king no longer worked and they needed their independence. So I like that this course is ending on the eve of July 2nd because it can inspire you as you go forth to tap into your own personal courage, to tap into your own personal commitment to the ideals of the country as you go forth and have conversations with yourselves, with your friends, with family about what we can do to make sure democracy remains alive and well and healthy. And that's what I think is so um, significant about the date today. You're keep going on. Yep, I'm moving on. You're welcome. So I want you to think about, next slide. I want you to think about, and I'm gonna give you some time to look at this. What declaration of possibility, note the word declaration, of possibility can you make that has the power to make a difference in your community? And when I say our community, that could be within your household, that could be with your best friends that get together for coffee, that could be with your children, that could be with your neighbor over the fence. I always think of that show with the neighbor over the fence that you could never see his face. What was it? Home, Home improvement. But they had these rich conversations. So I don't want you to think of community. I want you to define your community where you feel comfortable talking to someone else about what your declaration of possibility is. And I want you to ruminate on that a little bit. Think about that, the declaration of possibility. We as a SOSIS declared our possibility in this ideals that we want to bring forth and make more present in people's consciousness about the rich traditions of our democracy, about the hope that it inspires in all of us, about how sometimes it gets beat up, but it rises again because of the ideals, these freedoms that we are born with and we believe in so firmly that we are not willing to sit on the sidelines and let's subside. And I want you to think about your declaration of possibility. All right, percolate on that a little bit. Jot some ideas down. Whatever comes, and I don't want you to judge it or evaluate. You know how sometimes we have an idea, oh, it's not good enough, or it's not this, or it's not that. Just jot some things down. One, two, three, go. Bless you. You're welcome. We're gonna jot down some of your ideas, okay? Who would like to volunteer? Rose, Rose, go ahead. Go ahead, Rose, thank you. We just have some new neighbors on our block. We have some new neighbors on our block and it's been a while since I've had any kind of a gathering, so that's one way everybody can get to know each other. Okay. So you're going to you're going to have invite, a invite and convene uh, your, the neighbors in your block to have a block party and see where that takes you. Beautiful. Okay. Who else? Who else? 
possibility. I'm going to, I'm going to just give this mic to somebody. I think I'm just going to give it to Karen here. Hold it close. Um, so I do, I do speak with my neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned. Uh, and, and those messages I would give would be, we have more in common than in the ways we differ. We have a hard one reason to celebrate and unique freedoms to protect greater than that of any other country. We need to learn about individuals, not groups. Okay. How do we do that? Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. My bad. Okay. Who, who's going to go next? I, I, I'm going to stay on this end. Okay. I'll go over here. Okay. Anybody? Here I come. Whether you Jan, raise has, hand or Jan has something here. Go ahead. Okay. I just put Jan. It's not on. It's not on. It's not on. Bring close. Hold it close. Perfect. Can you hear me? No. I can, but they, maybe yeah. others can. Push the bottom. Here, go ahead. You're going to have two mics in front push, of you. Push. All right, two mics. Here we there go. we go. I put down, get involved, not overwhelmed. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to popcorn over here. Here we go. Hello. And this is Liz. Yes. Lynn? Yes. Okay. I'm going to describe an event that uh, uh, five people got involved in in our neighborhood in a square block and we chose to defeat a school bond election and we did it with that five group and the reason for telling you this story is if you want to do something it's an example of you can do things if you really want to okay so anyways we acquired 60 percent of the vote successfully to defeat the school bond issue and we defeated an individual i will not name him, but he was the driver that made Coors Field happen. So five people defeated a bigger thing. But okay. it wasn't to build a school. <laughs> thank, thank you. That wasn't what we were defeating. No, we were, they wanted to. Are any of you familiar with a, a lady in history named Margaret Mead? Yes. Margaret Mead, what was what her famous quote? What was her quote? Never, never doubt. What a small group of individuals, I'm paraphrasing poorly, never doubt what a small group of individuals can do when they come together. And accomplish. In, indeed, it's, she's a small group person in terms of believing small groups are the way to get things done. Yeah, thank you. Who else? Around this side. Yeah, I got somebody over here. And this mic now works two ways. There we go. Hold it close. Okay. Um possibility I thought of would be for um, asking for polite conversation from our community members during a community meeting that has to do with community business. Okay. Yeah, polite conversation. I, well, you could call it civil. Civil. I mean, part of our our tagline is creating evolved civility, in a way where we can we can be able to do something. So I take it you were part of a meeting recently, Stevie, where that didn't happen. Oh my yes, yes oh. I was. Okay. Okay. All right. Was there a ground rule set up during that meeting for civility and politeness? To. Okay. All right. Something else we talk about too in terms of what needs to happen pre meetings. Okay, who else over here? Oh, we got one over here. Okay. You think? I do. I hear. I feel Kevin's thoughts. Hold it close. My declaration is to contribute and add value to my neighborhood through the need for uh, uh, basically community landscaping. Okay. <laughs> Maria. Hi. Does that work? It works. Sort of. Uh, the Declaration of Possibility. <clears throat> well, I feel like, what can I do? Continue to get involved locally, which I've done, uh, and where you can possibly make a difference. And today I had a great meeting with Don Haddad, the superintendent of schools, and the symphony board wanted to meet him and the conductor to try to uh, work together to make uh, summer music camps and some, you know, working together. 
and we had a nice meeting. And that felt like, well, not much. Doesn't help the presidential debate, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> We had to bring that up. Um, it's all right. So, but let me let me just say that that is a big deal. And I know Maria. And didn't didn't someone you know recently become the uh, uh, president of the board? Oh, oh, Tim. Yeah. Is that your Tim? Okay. All right. She's married to a guy named Tim O'Neill. Yeah. Okay. Well, you straighten me out. Okay, John, I'm coming your way. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, three things. One, uh, Dr. Little League team is going to watch the play. Okay. Two, um, I wrote a thing about why the why I fought a flag. I'm going to publish publish the time's call. I'm going to put a little uh, hashtag out my. Probably why some people didn't see what I think about uh, my flight fly. Okay. Anyway, I, run a, I run a program called Building Democracy Day. I tell you what, I bring all kinds of kids into kids into deal with local issues. Kids and local leaders walk out saying the same thing about each other. They walk out saying, people are smart and they really care about each other. Thank you. Kent, I just want people to know a little bit about your background. Can, can you give me that mic back? I, Kent used to be a teacher at St. Brain Valley Schools, and what did you teach, Kent? Yeah. Social the studies. Microphone not working. Oh. He taught social studies and history. Okay, social studies. How many years were you a teacher in this district? Me too. Beautiful. Thank you for your service. All right. Okay. John. Um, my, my declaration is I want to live in a community where everyone has a decent, safe, and affordable place to live. And the reason why John is big on that is because he's one of the bigwigs in Habitat for Humanity, and he's part of uh, he's part of what makes this housing happens in our community in a big way. So thank you. Michelle, I know you have something to say. <laughs> Hold it close, uh, Michelle. Hello. Um, but I just said, uh, I want to lead by example, and I want to lead with an open mind and an open heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beautiful. We got Don okay. Donna right okay. here. Okay, go ahead. Um, I have down be an educator and a student. Oh. Uh -huh. And my example would be. Um, I share, I am part of a volunteer group, as is Kevin, uh, sharing information about Medicare to help people get the health services they need um, as, as in the community from wealthy to poor people, um, low income people. And um, being a student would be reaching out and finding areas where I can become better educated uh, with what's going on in my community. Thank you. Tom. I continue my, my teaching classes, or the classes that I teach, uh, plus maybe some other subjects, such as ESL, which is just about needed. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Who else on this side? Okay. Wait. Hold on, hold on. Hold it close. One of the things that I really like about this community is that we have the sort of justice for members of the community what do you do with restorative justice? Nothing yet, but I said volunteer. All right, well, that's what you're going to do. What's your, which, which, this is Estera. Okay, Estera, let me just give you a little history, if you don't mind, on restorative principles, practices, and justice. We started that, Beverly Title and I started that back in 1996 in this community. Is that for those of you who don't know, we put close to 8,000 people through restorative justice versus arresting them in this community. And so your, your um, declaration of possibility is that you want to become involved as a volunteer with the Longmont Community Justice Partnership, which provides restorative justice services. Beautiful. 
All right. Okay, Melinda, I was wondering when you were going to pop up. I have a couple. One, I'm part of the LCJP program, and I'd be happy to talk with you about that. And um, it's a wonderful program. I'm near and dear to my heart also. Um, <clears throat> possibilities that I think I can be part of is to also um, address in my own tiny way um, affordable housing for from two different venues that I have available to me, and to um, contribute to something that I'm learning to call relational poverty, to um, reducing relational poverty in community. Explain that, what that, what's relational poverty? We think we know what it means, but go ahead, Melinda. Yeah, as I'm understanding it, relational poverty is when we either, by our own choice or by choices others make for us, cut off relationships that are foundational to success. So uh, become family estranged, friend estranged, um, all kinds of circumstances like that, and um, see if I can part of reversing that trend. Beautiful. So instead of saying maybe eliminate relational poverty, we can say enhance the relational abundance. Okay, very good, thank you. I'm willing to run up there. Jake, I'm willing to run up there <laughs> on, on these small steps, though. Because I know Jake has stuff to offer. Uh, similar to what a lot of people have been saying, I just said, you know, um, being willing to listen, uh, take in everything someone's saying without immediately judging and it's against what you say, so. Uh, just really participating in that active listening, uh, making sure we embrace differences so that we can actually have a fruitful conversation. Beautiful. And uh, Jake, I'm just also going to say about Jake, Jake recently joined the School of Statesmanship, Stewardship, and Service Board. So thank you, Jake. Who else over here? I know you got your mic. Yep. I have anybody that I missed? No, you wanna... Nope, 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 nope. Thank you for your comments. We've wrote, written down a lot of great things. And if you all follow through with what you say you're gonna follow through with, democracy will work even better in this community. Okay. Go, or where am I? <laughs> where am I? We're, on, we're on this one. Oh, that's you. Yeah. That's you. Okay, so um, one of the courses that we teach is encouraging people to kind of get more in alignment with trend lines and pay less attention to the headlines. Um, and so we're filled with headlines this week. We're absolutely filled with headlines. And a lot of times those headlines, depending on who you are, depending on what, where your head's at, can be, can be difficult. For people. So, but what we encourage people to do, and we teach the class, and it's called kind of focusing more on trend lines. And so, and so what trend lines do help us with, it helps us understand really what's happened in history. Where are we at where, compared to where we were 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, even up to 500 years ago? Now, we talked about a book. Um, maybe in our first couple of classes, it was called, it's called Enlightenment Now, written by Steven Pinker. We still highly recommend that book. There's another book, Enlightenment Now, for those of you writing it down, by Steven Pinker. There's another book called Factfulness, well, one word, Factfulness, by Hans Rosling. They approach trend lines from a different, in a different way. But they all come to, they both come to the same conclusions. And so if we understand what, re, what the reality is from the past, what's happened over the last 50, 100, 200, 300, 500 years ago, that will kind of give us a trajectory of where we're at. And in terms of what's happened, in terms of here's the arc from the past. And then if we want to think about, as we teach also, how to create a future that's different than the present or the past, then we're gonna know something about the future. A future that you've heard us say 
that have those qualities of aliveness and being that we want to live into and inhabit. And so once we understand the past, and once we understand what kind of future we want to create, then we can do things and take actions in the present. And that's what this, that's what this class is about. And so anyway, um, I want to give you one example. It happens to be on democracy. And so um, in, in the last 50 years, here's what's happened in the last 50 years on this planet. The number of democracies in the world has increased from 31 to 130 nations. Now, every now and then you're going to hear a headline that they had a headline that, well, oh my gosh, the autocrats are kind of pushing their way around the world now. We have people in Russia, we have people in China, we have people in Iran, people in North Korea, or typically the countries that are mentioned that are that are run autocratically that are trying to trying to bully their way around the planet. And some of them are trying. There's no question about that. But in light of that headline, here's a trend line that says something about what's really going on with the enhancement of democracy around our planet. So we're coming at this from a total of 193 nations in the world. Now, if we include 17 countries where democracy is forming, and it is forming, and it's more free, their societies are more free than not, 67% of the people on this planet live in a free or relatively free society. And so that's the trend line. I want you to get used to the idea of what a trend line is. This is data. And sometimes this class could be called how, how data or how information can get in the way of a good story. And the good story is often the headline. And so, and so, but the data says something different. Now, going down below that, in 1816, look at that uh, 1% of this planet, of the population on this planet, 1%. You're writing all this down, but you're going to get all of this in slides. Some of you are writing it down. That's fine. You can keep on writing if that's the nature of how you, how you, how you go to class. But 1% of this planet lived in a democracy. In 1850, 7% of the people lived in a democracy, 7% of the planet. In 1900, 20% of the people lived in a democracy. In 1950, 40% of the people on this planet lived in a democracy. And now, 67% of the people live in a democracy, in a, either in a relatively free or free society. Now, that's not data you're, also, you're going to get from the news sources that you're watching. But these are trend lines, and they come from those books, and there's other books out there, The Rational Optimist, and there's another one as well. But there's four authors that we gave you in the past that all came to the same conclusion with their independent research. This is what it shows. Now, these trend lines are... There's a lot of other trend lines. There's a lot of, trend, uh, like... Uh, um, Steven Pinker goes through probably 45 or 50 different kinds of here's what's happening in nutrition, here's what's happening in safety, here's what's happening with violence, here's what's happening with mortality rates, here's what's happening in lifespans, so many different, here's what's happening in health, here's how many billions of people have been saved due to uh, new health care, new medical uh, uh, discoveries, uh, vaccinations, etc., so we're not going to go over those tonight. We're just going to go over the ones with democracy. All right. This is Carol's. All right. So am I on? I'm yeah. not on. All right. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, about 20 years ago, I was up in Estes Park, and there was a congressman up there, and he showed me this cycle. Now, I, uh, I have shown it to a lot of people. It was based on freedom and then oppression. When you're oppressed, and then I looked it up academically. It's, the, it's called the Titler cycle. Titler, has anybody seen this before? He was a Scottish historian in the 1800s. He studied the Roman Empire, the Greek civilizations, all the great civilizations, and have you ever sat and gone, well, what happened? Why didn't the Romans hang on to what they had? They had it all, right? Right, so what happened? Anybody 
See what happened? When we're under bondage or when we're oppressed or think about racial, even racial groups or ethnic groups or countries, when there's oppression, when there's something I can't, I cannot continue to live under this stress, under this duress. What does it take to break out of that? And you will see he talks about a spiritual faith. I've seen it, uh, a spiritual truth. Something comes about from the inside that gives you courage. Now, we, <laughs> we as people, um, we may feel very intimidated by taking action. You might have said in your declaration of possibility, I wrote down, I am going to walk around all 100 homes in my neighborhood and meet my neighbors and get their names. I am gonna knock on those doors. I'm sorry if it feels harsh, you know, but we don't have anybody's email. We don't have a way to keep in touch with each other. And it's time we do that for a lot of reasons, for a lot of good reasons, for a lot of positive reasons. And, you know, you have HOA groups that say, no, everybody needs their privacy. Nah, I think everybody needs their connections and they need to know you care, right? So having courage means you will step out in that faith, however you want to talk about it. That leads to liberty. Liberty leads to abundance because when we're free to make choices, when we're free to have enterprise, when we're free to start a business, when we're free to think about wealth, our minds aren't having to think about danger. We go into abundance. Look what happens the minute you hit abundance. As a society becomes comfortable in their abundance, having enough food, having protection on their borders, we have a good military, having an established culture, the citizens begin to search for a purpose because they're not having to fight for it anymore. I hate the word fight anymore. Do you hear it on the news and you go, why do we have to use that word? Why is it always a fight? Yes, it's an internal struggle on developing enough faith that you'll step out in courage. But then notice what happens when you just hit abundance and you don't have the next purpose. You just kind of bring all that abundance into your own selfishness, your own personal ambition. That leads to apathy or complacency leads to dependency because you gave up your liberty, leads you right back to bondage. The Roman Empire just dissolved on itself because they forgot to take care of the empire. Right? And guess what the time is that Mr. Titler has, anybody can guess how much time it takes to go through this cycle? 200 years. What happened to us in the 1960s, the 1970s? Did we start to see a shift? Think about it. So, go. Next. We're going to talk about mediocre. Um, as, as I started to read through mediocrity and into the science of it, it was this limbo place. I never thought about it in terms of mediocrity, it is kind of the opposite of excellence. So neither success, neither failure, it's kind of not good, not bad, it's halfway between everything. It's not exceptional in any way. Do we want our democracy to be exceptional? Do we want to have excellence? Yeah, so how does mediocrity play out right now? Thank you, thank you. All right, so we want to spend just a little time with this. And we've talked, something, we've talked a little bit about some of these symptoms, mediocrity and citizenship. Now, I want to go back and just say democracy, a democracy is an ideal. We all know that. It's an ideal. And, and as Carol talked a little bit about that cycle of what we can go through, uh, we have to be thinking about, well, what are, what are the dangers of an ideal? What are the dangers of democracy? What can happen? In a, 
It's not just the dangers to democracy, but what are the dangers of democracy? What are they? And so unhealthy dependency on government, institutions, leaders, you've heard us talk about that ad nauseum in terms of, we say, well, someone else is going to take care of it. Let's just call the government. In my business, let's just dial 911. I don't need to go talk to my neighbor. And, 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 I, and I thought for a long time, 70% of the time, what people needed more than calling the police was a neighbor. And so, but no, they ended up, and so that was part of what happened. Willingness to accept what others have in mind for us. In other words, that's that sense of uh, a consumer. We're, we're willing to become consumers instead of kind of committing to reclaiming our citizenship. We want to buy and purchase our satisfaction in so many different ways in, in a very secular, materialistic-like environment. Instead of saying, okay, I'm going to be a citizen, I'm going to reclaim my citizenship, and I'm going to be part of creating a new future, like what you all just talked about in your declarations of possibilities. Passive consumers of institutional services kind of run hand in hand with those things we just talked about. And as we talked about, I think the first night when we vote, sometimes we become consumers of elected officials. What do, we, what do they have in mind for us? What answers do they have? Instead of asking us questions and making us feel a little bit uncomfortable, what, what, do we, what are we willing to do differently? Tend towards isolation and disconnectedness, fearful, paralyzed act. You know, Melinda talked about relational poverty, also disconnectedness, isolation. I think the attorney, uh, the Surgeon General re recently characterized loneliness as an epidemic in our country. Loneliness can be called isolation, disconnectedness, not, not having relationships, being in relational poverty. Uninformed and educa uneducated about circumstances in our neighborhoods, communities, state, nation, world, democracy, stuck in small boxes. Carol found, somehow found this, I don't know if it's a photograph or a, a, an AI representation, but the, this, these are the small boxes of thought. I thought that was a pretty good kind of reflection. A picture of Congress, all right, all right. Okay, thank you, John. Immature, allow others to take responsibility. I don't need to vote. I don't care about what my neighbors are doing. I don't care what's going on in the community. I'm just gonna kind of hang in there and kind of let someone else take care of it. Mediocrity in government and institutions. Isolated, governments isolated from community and citizens. Loss of sense of service, dignity of public service. Where's that at in terms of why, are, why do they have the jobs they have? Why did they sign up to be a public servant? The mindset of circle the wagon. Sometimes government, people in government can really get defensive, can get a sense of, well, they're being criticized. They're being criticized by the media. They're being criticized by people in the community. And they circle the wagons. And next thing you know, it's hard to get anything out of Government, the word transparency kind of disappears or takes on a new definition. Focused on revenue capital. Oftentimes, folks say, well, let's start something. We want to begin. Let's begin something. Well, where are we going to find the funding is a sentence that, that happens pretty quickly. This is revenue capital versus what we've been talking about all along, which is social capital. And as I've said several times, social capital, I believe social capital is the next frontier for government. How can we access all the brain power, all the heart power, all the soul power in our country in a way that kind of brings it together? Those are the skill sets that we teach in our school of statesmanship. Not open to outside input, not listening to a constituency, lack skill sets. This is one that we're really gonna have to get better at. We have 340 million people in this democracy and everybody has their voice counts, their thoughts matter, their humanness is valued. Who's going to pull all that together so that it makes sense? We don't have the skill sets right now to harmonize various perspectives and lack of understanding on how to apply compassion and empathy. It's their systems. These are folks who work in systems, institutions, and they, they want to know if the system works or they want to know if, if a um, professional service provider's can they offer that compassion? Maybe sometimes they can, but oftentimes that's difficult. Mediocrity in le leadership. We've talked about patriarchal models of leadership versus models where we activate the common good. Lack of intellectual capacity. 
lack of moral fitness, moral compass, old models of leaders having all the answers. We talked about how we believe leaders need to figure out how to ask powerful questions that can get people to kind of step out of their box, it, it get them to choose accountability versus the leaders always having the answers. They have, they don't necessarily see the value in inviting, convening, facilitating, harmonizing citizens. That leads, in, in our opinion, to mediocrity. They don't ask the powerful questions and are not interested in everyone's thoughts and voices. And so that's, that's the model of leadership we're in. And by the way, folks, as we kind of go through the headlines and listen to the news today, we're all kind of subject to that. It's all, it's, it's what we're saying is we need the, we need the best leaders. We've romanticized leaders to the nth degree. It's like they're the cause and everybody else is the effect. And, and that, that we can't be the we can't be the cause ourselves, and so that's the change we need to make as citizens, and that's the role that leaders we believe need to play in terms of saying your voice counts, your thoughts matter. How can we figure out how to make it work? I came up with this in the last week, so here's another. But Carol found a great uh, a great photograph here. I don't know if it's a photograph or an AI rendition. But we can't be comfortable and courageous at the same time. That's part of what citizenship is about. That's part of what we need to figure out, inviting people to dare to be different, to dare to kind of reach out. And so I'm calling it the couch culture. Uh, a couch culture says, I'm going to try to solve all of the issues from my couch, from my living room, from my sofa. And I'm going to watch the, the latest TV series, or I'm going to figure out what's on the news and just kind of get wrapped up in that. And so that's the couch culture. You get what I mean for that. It leads to animosity and distrust. Uh, comfort weakens us, makes us complacent. We know that. One of the phrases I use is, and you know, one of the enemies of culture is comfort, familiarity, and safety. We all want those. We want those things in our life. We get those and we deserve those things. But if we hang out, in that zone of comfort, familiarity, and safety on an ongoing basis, we're going to lose our capacity to kind of um, manifest courage. We feel alienated from the greater society, again, back to Melinda's relational poverty. Citizens pursue their own interests. You know, ambition's okay. I'm not knocking ambition. I have ambition. Many of you have ambition. But our take is ambition needs to be socialized for the good of the whole. In other words, you can have ambition, you can want to promote yourself, you can want to be a leader, you can want to have more influence, but we're highly recommending that that ambition be socialized so that it works for the good of everybody. All right, and this could leave society in a state of decay. So it's the couch culture versus the courage culture. So think of yourself, where you're at, what you're doing, what that looks like, what could you be doing, Anyway, there we go. All right, this is Carol, or no, this is Stephanie. Okay. So I should take a look at that word nature. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. So you all know that I took that trip to Spain and Portugal. I was gone for, I took teenagers to Spain and Portugal. And one part of the journey, a young lady was homesick, miserably homesick, and so I was helping her, I was helping her, I was helping her, I was being the mom on the trip. And one night she said, I have to go home right now or I'm gonna harm myself. And she looks at me and she goes, and don't you mom me. <laughs> so at that point in time, I had to change the direction of the energy that was coming at me. So I said, okay, do I have permission to ask you some hard questions? She said, yes. And I said, if I mom you, let me know and I will apologize because I'm not intending to mom you. I'm just trying to understand. So I said, she said, I want to go home tonight or I'm going to harm myself. And I said, okay, that is an option. That is absolutely an option. I don't think I could get you out of here tonight but it's an option that you could go home. So can we put that option on the table? She said, yes. She was full force ready to do this. And I said, are you open to any other options right now? 
nobody had asked her that. And she said, yeah. I said, okay, so option one, you wanna go home within the next 40 hours. Um, option two, could we get you home in 72 hours? Because I knew if we got her to 72, we could get her home Friday. She said, yeah, that's an option. Um, is there any other options that you're open to? So the point of the story, we got her, she never went home. She slept really good that night. She needed some melatonin, I gave her some melatonin. She calmed down. At the end of the trip, she came up to me and she said, thanks for having faith in me and recognizing where I was. And what, the reason I share that story with you is there are a lot of people in the world right now that have mixed emotions about all that's going on. Let's not demean, let's not embarrass, let's not diminish. Whatever they are is where they are. Let's meet them where they are and bring them into a place, acknowledge where they are, and not let the inertia of staying at rest destroy the possibility. Is that, are you following me? So she wrote me a thank you note after I got home. And she apologized, she said, thanks for getting me to the end of the trip, and I'm sorry I snapped at you for being my mom. And then she put, thanks for being my mom. <laughs> so a teenager lost, confused, teenagers are oftentimes that way, but they're so amazing at the same time. And sometimes I think people in the society at large, that force that comes at us frightens us and pushes us out of our game. I made a decision not to get pushed out of what I wanted her to do. And so I want you to think of that when you're asking conversations with people about sometimes touchy topics. One of the biggest obstacles to staying in motion is committing to too much and becoming overwhelmed. I didn't want to commit to too much to be overwhelmed and not make her possibility come true. We could have gotten her home, but it would have been thousands of dollars. When I told her that, she said, I don't have that kind of money. So, well, it's gonna, that's what it's going to take. Realistic options, but honoring where you are. Making sense? You must learn to change the way you think. Small steps. Sometimes when I want to get involved in something and make a bigger decision or a bigger impact, I get in my own way. Because I think it should be grand. Everybody should feel this way, right? I'm so excited about this idea. Everybody should. Have I gotten in my own way already? And so I have to meet people where they are. I have to create a space and allow the energy, whatever energy they're bringing to this conversation, to help me move each other. And one of my go-to phrases that I always use if I don't understand where people are coming with this energy is, and it helps me answer this one, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Tell me how you got there. Just explain how you got there in that belief, in that conclusion, in that opinion. Help me understand how you got there. If I ask more questions rather than come to more conclusions, we can move together. Does this make sense? following. Easier said than done, right? As, so then you find ways that you could do that with someone. Find a phrase that works for you where you open up that space and you take that energy that's in that moment and you help move the conversation. Sometimes scary, sometimes uncomfortable. I was very uncomfortable when she said that. None of the other teachers would talk to her. They go, Steffi, come in here this room. We have to have you in here talking to her. And I always learned, if you can honor where people are in the moment, no matter how terrified they are, they've been heard. They've been heard. Not diminished or demeaned, but they've been heard. And then you can move them. So I didn't try to solve the problems by saying to her, you can't go home right now. There is no possible way you're going to go home. I would have lost the whole thing. And she, say, she stayed for the whole trip. So take from that conversation I had with you and with her what you could do in your conversations. I love the idea that Carol's going to go into the neighborhood. I'm going to try that. Introduce myself. I've introduced myself to some neighborhoods, but I haven't got up and around the corner in the streets. And let them know that we're all here to help each other. We're out here to have a conversation. All right. Next. <clears throat> So to tie this together, I didn't accept her conversation about despair and hopelessness. She didn't harm herself. And she said, another thing she said, is I'm stronger than I thought I was. Absolutely you are. Absolutely you are. So what I want you to do in your small groups, or your big groups, next to your, na your neighbors next to you, think about these questions. People in history did not accept the narrative of despair and hopelessness. 
Those founding fathers on July 1st and 2nd didn't help, didn't respond, didn't, they knew the reality and they still pushed forward. What is the fourth that, force excuse me, that moves you to action? Identify it, name it. Why do you listen to that force? I sometimes have names for forces that move me. I call it mom. My mom's no longer here with me. Thank you, mom. Or I'll just say, thank you, who's ever there. Or I'll say a student's name who's changed the way I looked at things. I credit them for bringing that gift of awareness to me in that moment. Where can you see yourself creating a ripple, extending your influence, planting a seed? I had a class closing little bit story. I had a contact from a young lady today. She's graduating college. When I had her as a sophomore in high school, she was suicidal. She didn't trust anybody. Today, she's studying to be a nurse. That ripple, create a space. Just create a space, listen. Ask a question. Tell me how you got here. You're free to discuss in your groups. Enjoy the conversations.